some games seem like pure gold if you play them when you're four years old. One of the worst feelings you can ever have with any game is coming back to it years later and realizing it wasn't as good as you remember. And with how much I and many others like to discuss older games, this is far from uncommon. Now, I say fell from grace and not loved but are now hated because most of these games are less bad and more just poorly aged. As for how a game can fall from grace, there are many ways. Maybe its mechanics were copied and done better in other games. Maybe it had flaws that we didn't notice at the time. Maybe it got screwed over via updates. Or in rare cases, something scummy happened behind the scenes that made people abandon it out of principle. We'll be trying to avoid as many as possible examples of first game syndrome, since it's more expected there. And one important distinction is that these entries are mainly based on personal observations. So, a lot of bias here. Well, more than usual, anyway. Once upon a time, making edgy adult humor was simple. Mask a violent or disturbing product behind seemingly family-friendly visuals. That's pretty much why Conker's Bad Fur Day had such a strong following. For some reason, someone at Rare changed course from an adorable squirrel mascot into a chugger of Jack Daniels coming across a bunch of profanity-spewing cartoon characters. Sometimes you'd even get a movie reference here and there. It's raunchy, brutal, self-aware, and it got a good laugh out of players. If you take all that out, though, you're left with a very linear game and a handful of clunky mechanics. Sure, the multiplayer is a lot of fun, but why couldn't the main game be that good? And let's be frank here, as much as we loved these jokes back then, they don't hold up very well today. Yeah, there are still some strong bullseyes here and there, Great Mighty Pooh and the War Chapters are still the best parts of the game to date, but other than that, most of the game is just ooh gore, ooh sex joke, ooh movie reference. It's not even satirical, it's just shock humor and hey, this existed. The sad part is that Conquer never really got to evolve after this game. Ever since Rare's downfall, nothing was really done with the IP to make something interesting and fresh. There's a reboot and a few tech demos, but those feel more like attempts to keep the IP. Unless someone really cares, we're not seeing anything on the level of Mongrels or Harley Quinn from this anytime soon. The reason Bad Fur Day is only this low is that people still don't really hate this game. Hardcore fans still get a kick out of the absurdist humor, dated as it may be. It feels like we're more in love with the potential of Conquer rather than the game itself. Knowing that there are still fans who do something with the vulgar little squirrel and even took inspiration from him, it's still really nice to see. I don't know about holding out hope for Conker's future, but Banjo can appear in Smash, miracles can still happen. How long have I been playing? Uh, seven hours. What? When you stop and think about it, the standard for a game being too long is pretty loosey-goosey. If what you're playing has enough to keep you invested in, wanting to move forward, you don't really care if you've been playing for a few hours, days, or weeks. But sometimes, events are spread so far apart where expected breaks in the action become bore fests or it cramps so much into it that playing feels more like a chore. The results? Yet another page from Rare's Book of Infamy is Donkey Kong 64. Initially, DK64 was amazing. It had a fun, simple plot with DK going to save his family from K. Rule. DK and his family all having unique abilities is a fun concept, and the visuals are nostalgic eye candy. Say what you want, but at the time, N64 graphics were the Picasso of video game imagery. Adding to it, it also came out at arguably the perfect time. 3D platformers and collect-a-thongs felt huge back then, and Rare firmly grasped the crown with Banjo-Kazooie. In theory, DK64 had a lot of good going for it. The problem... It's too much! It's too much! Five playable characters with five unique abilities sounds promising, but it backfires when each of them come with their own distinct collectibles. Oh, good for you, you found something as Lanky Kong? Oh, whoops, only Tiny Kong could get it. Looks like you gotta switch characters at the tag barrel all the way back the way you came. Hey, you got it. Oh, whoops, now only Diddy can get this next thing. Back to the barrel with you, rinse and repeat, and there's the issue. 
you basically have to scour the same level five times minimum as each Kong to find their distinct items. And you can only accomplish this with that freaking barrel that you gotta constantly backtrack to. Never mind how inconvenient it is. And as soon as you finish this wild goose chase, get ready for another next level. Oh, many recall how I uh, dubbed King K. Rule's boss fight to be one of the longest? Don't get me wrong, Brawl's a ton of fun, but after dealing with the tedious, never-ending cycle of collecting, backtracking, switching, and collecting again, who has the patience for a one last challenge? Suffice to say, it's more than the casual gamer can stomach nowadays. Some have said that this is what killed the Collectathon. Meanwhile, Banjo Kazooie and Tui are still looked back fondly because they kept it simple. Yeah, there's backtracking, but it's easier to manage and you don't have to keep shuffling through monkeys in a barrel. Oh, that's why they call it that. Donkey Kong 64 could have worked better if they either cut back on a few of their honestly creative ideas or just made swapping less tedious. If this gets remade, it will give the creators a chance to hopefully get the praise and applause they hoped for, instead of giving their players aneurysms at age 12. <laughs> Quite a few people were, expectedly, surprised when I informed them that people didn't like Metroid Fusion back in the day. Well, I might be two for two because guess what? Bubsy was actually pretty popular when it first came out. What? I know, I know, you don't believe me. Quite frankly, I don't blame you. All those videos mocking Bubsy, calling some of its games the worst of all time. However, leading up to its release, Bubsy was hyped to hell and back as the next Sonic the Hedgehog. And upon said release, it actually did pretty well, enough to get sequels and a cartoon pilot. Even Bubsy 3D, considered to be one of the worst games of all time, wasn't nearly as reviled when it first came out. The Golden Play Award and the words of praise on the cover? Those were real. I'll just go ahead and repeat myself, what? Of course, it's a completely different story these days. Standards have raised, and even for the time, Bubsy had plenty of flaws, inexplicable fall damage, cheap deaths, and uncontrollable speed. As for Bubsy 3D, <laughs> well... You're not so tough! Whoa, 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 Sting like a bee! Smart can! There was a period of time where it was practically a rite of passage for internet reviewers to make a video mocking Bubsy. It's a cat, and you put him in a shirt, BAM! It's Bubsy! I quit! And when it was announced that he would get a new game, the reaction was less, Bubsy's back, and more, Bubsy's back? We should have gotten a new Shadow Hearts, or a new Turok, or an F Zero, or a new Legend of Dragoon, or a new Star Fox, or a new Kid Icarus. <laughs> You hear a lot of fans talk about how great the first three Mega Man X games are and how the PlayStation era doesn't hold a candle to them. I haven't given a darn that X4 is so good it pretty much knocks the original trilogy out of the water, especially X3. Yeah, for a game regarded as one of the classics, people strangely don't talk about it as much anymore. And when it finally got attention again in recent times, the obscure glory did not last. Look back to X1 and X2. Look how vibrant their visuals are. The level designs in X1 are fair and challenging, and it only gets better in X2 with how much stronger the stage hazards get. As for X3's levels, the colors are drab, and the level designs, if not stupidly long, are straight up barren. A lot of it boils down to enemies dealing like 10 old pellets of damage to you each, and it stretches even further to the boss fights, where all their attacks boil down to moving left to right and abusing projectiles that drag you down, making them more annoying than challenging. Not to say there aren't good fights in the game, but those are the exception rather than the rule. One of the reasons X3 did get so hyped is, of course, Zero being playable. And still, even that isn't all too great since if you lose him once, you don't get to play as him again for the rest of the game. Way to limit the selling point. Oh yeah, I got this. What a pittance. And you might hear the argument, oh, they didn't have a lot of time to develop it, so that's why it didn't have a lot of stuff in it. Fair point. But does that justify claiming that it's better than X4, X5, or even X8? I don't think so. The game itself may be perfectly playable and is not as bad as, say, X6 or a creamy behemoth burst from Cavernous Bowels. But when there's almost nothing you can get from this game that's just better in others, why come back to it? 
just an empty shell of what could have been a decent game and never really had many qualities to be considered a classic. One good thing that did come out of this is that there are fan games that try to improve some of X3's Mavericks. That Blizzard Buffalo glow up is so good. Pop quiz, how many times have you heard this soul chestnut? Oh gee, this new gen sucks. This is top tier. OMG, this new gen sucks. This is top tier. OMG, this new gen sucks. This still exists. It's the never ending cycle of new Pokemon gens and new uh, back in the day, black and white got the worst of it. People turned their noses away and went wild when X and Y came into the picture on the 3DS. Oh my gosh, a 3D Pokemon game. That's usually just for side games. Now we got a 3D Core series title? And holy crap, these legendaries look cool. And Mega Evolution? Oh, this all washed the taste of black and white out of our mouths. That one didn't age quite so well. Nowadays, fans are looking back on Gen 5 and realizing, hey, maybe it's not as bad as we made it sound. Meanwhile, the cracks in Gen 6 are becoming a lot more noticeable. Don't get me wrong, still plenty to enjoy. It introduced fairy types, Fennekin, Greninja, Fennekin again. But other than that, well, eh, let's review, shall we? For starters, Gen 6 arguably has one of the worst character lineups in any Pokemon game. While other rivals have at least been intriguing or a worthy foil to our journey, we've got Larry, Moe, and Curly Joe over here. Serena and Callum are at least competent, but they don't really do much. I'm all for the idea of having multiple rivals, but what's the point if none of them are interesting? And as for Team Flare, oh, just ask around. They're absolutely one of the most hated villain teams amongst the fandom. RML got some pushback on her villain team ranking because she didn't hate them enough. Think about that. Outside of poor characters, the environment, while pretty, isn't as varied as other gens. The pacing is really inconsistent, the gyms are so freaking easy, and the Megas? Wasted potential. They were built up to be this amazing mystery that you have to uncover, then they just kind of forgot about it. Give Sword and Shield credit, at least Dynamax tied into the plot. Mega Evolution is such a cool idea that's never used again. Worst of all, remember Zygarde? The third legendary that reveals itself when Kalos' ecosystem falls into disarray? No follow-up. They had the perfect opportunity to expand on Zygarde with the third gen 6 entry, sequel, or at least some DLC, and they didn't take it. They instead just dangled that plot point and yanked it away. Gen 5 and 7 had their own follow-ups. Why did they choose to skip this year? It's like they wanted this gen to die out as fast as possible. While Pokemon X and Y were really hyped up at the time, said hype really fizzled out. They had a few quality of life improvements, but fell short in terms of graphics, mechanics, and story. If anything, it at least helps us to appreciate the more underrated chapters in the franchise. And hey, it could have been worse. Could have been Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Gotta take the wins where you can. All right, hot take. I think The Last of Us kinda sucks. Not part two, I'm talking the original 2013 game. <laughs> Put the pitchforks down. I know it may seem like blasphemy to many of you, but after talking it out with some people, let me explain my reasoning. First, let us consider The Last of Us as a game. Visually, it's pretty good for the time, and the relationship between Ellie and Joel is pretty great. Everything else. The gameplay is a copy and paste of a dozen different cover shooters, and longtime viewers will know how I feel about those. What changes they do make to that formula are almost invariably for the worse in the name of realism. The writing that isn't directly about Ellie and Joel's relationship is average at best and cringe-inducing at worst. Yes, I'm looking at you, religious cannibal cult. Secondly, the game's lore is just a basic zombie world with one major hiccup. Ellie is the only one immune, so naturally she's pretty important to the plot. Oh, about that, you find this gem of an audio log in the DLC, basically destroying the entire plot of the game and making both The Last of Us 1 and 2 completely pointless. Thanks guys, I feel like a moron for caring about your world and having an opinion on its hero's difficult choice. Thirdly and finally for this segment, this is the game that made the public 
take video game storytelling seriously. Not Metal Gear, not Final Fantasy VI, not Undertale, not a dozen other titles I could name with great stories, it was this. A long time ago, people did criticize the story of The Last of Us for being an Oscar bait movie shoved into a video game box. They were called haters and contrarians and all the rest. But now that we had the TV show, were they wrong? As time went on, the veil was slowly pulled back and we saw The Last of Us for what it truly was. A mediocre game with an unoriginal story that got propelled to stardom because people wanted the general public to take video games seriously. But as time went on and more people were exposed to this game with multiple remasters and an above average TV show and more people thought about it, the more the flaws became apparent. And slowly, it simply fell from grace. The Dreamcast is an underrated piece of gaming history. For its time, it really pushed graphical capabilities by giving us a console with almost GameCube-like graphics in the 90s. But you know the old saying, what Sega does is what everyone else does better. Is, is that the saying? Yeah, I don't care. Either way, despite its graphical prowess, it was still the final nail in the coffin for Sega's console career. However, its swan song gave us two amazing open world sandboxes that pushed what open world storytelling could do at the time. These would become known as, and known as when they were released, as Shenmue 1 and 2. They pioneered the open world gameplay mechanic, as well as other action game staples like quick time events. Despite this, the games didn't sell too well, being stuck on the commercially unsuccessful Dreamcast. However, their impact lasted in gamers' minds throughout the years, and eventually gave a new rise to Shenmue 3, almost 15 years later. <coughs> through one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns at the time announced during E3. However, like a good number of Kickstarter campaigns from back then, didn't hold water. It's a very interesting case of exposure causing an enormous backfire effect. Once gamers new and old got their hands on the remastered Shenmue, they were left asking, Wow, is the writing always this bad? Hey, what's wrong? <laughs> it was. If you want to chat, can you ask someone else? Can I ask you something? Yeah! Don't talk to me! It was always this bad. I mean, it has a sort of ironic charm. Like, hey, it's like we're watching a dubbed martial arts film directed by Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> Not only that, but Shenmue's gameplay comes from an era where Super Mario 64's 3D handling was the pinnacle. Not the bare minimum standard it is today. Despite a lot of older fans trying so very hard to justify their purchase, Shenmue 3 also became a flop despite being on more successful consoles. And by this point, the Sega open world action game thirst was quickly overshadowed by another franchise whose staying power is lasting even now. Ryo himself has appeared in a couple of crossover games like Sega and Sonic All-Stars Racing and Project X Zone 2, but that's it. Creator Yu Suzuki hasn't given up and still wants to complete the franchise. And who knows, with enough passion and drive, he might be able to do so. Right, he got into NFTs. And boned. Shenmue was important for its time, but it has not aged well in the slightest. We should be happy for what it gave us, even if both the concept of open world games and quick time events has also plagued us too since. <laughs> How long has it been since I've talked at all about Team Fortress 2? I haven't thoroughly covered it since top 50 favorite games in 2018. I mean, I semi-touched on it for 2022 fails, Valve fails, and fire-based characters, but that's really all I can remember. Yeah, the last times I mentioned it in a positive light in the last seven years, half of them were negative. What happened? I mean, y'all know what happened, but as a major fan of this game, gotta give it my dues. You all know I love this game. It is my most played online FPS of all time, next to Modern Warfare 1 and 2 because I don't know how many hours I logged on those. Anyways, the gameplay is tight and varied, the classes are fun, and everything is full of personality. It has one of the strongest, most productive, and creative communities you'll ever find in a game. It had everything. So what happened? Anybody work here? 
This is taking forever. Matchmaking. This was the game's first step into becoming virtually unenjoyable. Remember when joining a match was as quick as a click or two? The new system makes you wait for minutes before you can join one. Sometimes the load time takes so long you get disconnected anyway. And if you dare leave a game, you won't be able to join back and even risk being suspended. Now I know this was done with good intentions. It's supposed to be a countermeasure against auto balance as well as ensuring the game stays fair by sorting players into servers accordingly. But the speed of the game really took a huge toll because of it. At this point, you might as well join a custom server because even with auto balance, you still at least have the freedom to play however you want. Ever since this update, as well as a massive drought of anything afterward, the player base dropped so much, it's hard to enjoy the game casually anymore. As if that's not bad enough, the source code got leaked. So what comes next? Armageddon. Bots everywhere. I swear if I see one more Beyblade sniper, I'm getting the hard knuckle. Stay the game is in such disarray that this is what players consider fun. It's man versus machine, but without the man. Even with all these issues at hand, Valve barely does anything about it. They just leave the game dormant for years as it slowly destroys itself. For a while, they just rest on their laurels expecting fans to enjoy what's already there. They left like five people to keep the game on life support. Now, yes, there are still updates being made. We got big stuff like Contracts, Jungle Inferno, and new Halloween and Smithsmas maps. Recently, there's even a huge summer update with 14 new maps, including an official Saxton Hale mode. That's still undergoing pullbacks and fixes, but uh, yeah, it's something. But as long as matchmaking remains slow and bots run amok, we're still far from scraping the golden age of the fast-paced Merc combat. I was very tempted to put this at number one for a while, but as it stands, can't ignore just how magnanimous the support from the community still is. Even at its lowest, fans still go through highs and lows to protest for the game, yearning for it to be fixed so that we can embrace the glory it once had. And given recent updates, the chances of revival have gotten bigger than ever. This game still means so much to me after all these years. Even if I can't play it as much anymore, seeing fans happy and active again is all I could ask for. In the first year of the Great Calamity, more commonly referred to as 2016, Overwatch was one of the shining beacons of hope. From its announcement trailer alone, the game blew us away. People everywhere were excited to see this new universe with all these wonderful and expressive characters. With every new detail that we learned, the hype just kept building. People were Smash Bros levels of excited for this game. And when it came out, it delivered. For a good two years, this was the multiplayer game. You could not go anywhere without seeing some kind of clip, meme, or fan art. People loved the characters, the world, the gameplay. Then as everything else we've covered, the cracks began to show. The new heroes that were added to the game led to a shift from fun and fast paced firefights to slow and tedious shield spamming. To say nothing of the litany of balance issues the game faced. Like, okay, who decided it was a good idea to make Mercy's res a regular ability? And then there was Roll Queue, a matchmaking system that could rival League of Legends in terms of rage-induced computer tossing. And when Overwatch 2 got announced, the response was less sweet, a new game, and more, uh, guys, original's right there. With the devs working on Overwatch 2, this left the original game with no major updates or additions. Thus, the dissatisfaction festered to the point of people quitting entirely. That and the whole blizzard going up in flames behind the scenes thing didn't really help. Sexy. When we did get Overwatch 2, it pretty much just exacerbated every issue people had rather than create a new and fun experience. And with the original game shutting down, means we'll never get to re-experience that golden age. Say what you will about TF2, but you can still create a private server and just play with your friends. Want to do that in Overwatch? Sucks to be you. <laughs> TF2 may be mostly barren, but it was still strong enough to outlive a game twice. Nowadays, the only Overwatch content still going strong is that of a um, certain category. League of Legends. No one has ever really been happy with the state of this. It's the game everyone hates, but everyone plays. It can't be stopped. It's self-sustaining. Hello Neighbor, weird case of undulation. Alpha was loved, release was hated, the reviews came back up, and now no one knows about it. Super Mario Party, celebrated as a return to form for the series. Wait, there's a tier list? 
Great, you have allies or you're dead weight. PUBG, once upon a time, it was the king of battle royales. Then Fortnite happened, the end. Spore, amazing creation tool with shallow gameplay. Was huge with Let's Players for a bit before it fizzled out. Warhammer Darktide, premium currency and randomized mission types killed what could have been the perfect 40k successor to Vermintide. The tale of World of Warcraft is a tragedy. Assaulted from both without and within, what was once the god king of MMOs is now a shadow of its former self. As much as I'd love to wax poetic about how this happened, honestly, everybody already knows. Everything changed when the Activision nation attacked. It's hard to believe it was back in 2008 when Activision gobbled up the then beloved Blizzard who were in the middle of World of Warcraft's Burning Crusade expansion. At first, no one realized how far things would fall. Wrath of the Lich King was received fairly positively. Maybe Activision wouldn't ruin Blizzard? Then Cataclysm happened. People were less positive about Cataclysm, but it was still good. Then Mr. Pandaria happened. Okay, people did not like the Kung Fu Panda expansion as much. But hey, uh, Legion would buck the downward trend and became a beloved expansion from what I understand. Battle of Azeroth, which directly followed Legion, would signal World of Warcraft's true fall from grace. Though I will say it's not entirely that expansion's fault. It was just a perfect storm. The sexual harassment lawsuits, the mediocre writing for the expansion, the endless busywork that would also plague Shadowlands, and of course, no tale about World of Warcraft's fall would be complete without at least mentioning the MMO that surged in popularity as World of Warcraft's fan base shriveled. Final Fantasy XIV. Funny. As a child, I loved horror stories. Now, I mean one. Had it been any one of these four things, World of Warcraft probably would have recovered its public image sooner or later. But the actions of the developers and the parent company tainted World of Warcraft's reputation and having a quality competitor ready to take its place meant even a small stumble would have caused a lot of trouble. Never meant the dive as big as Actablizz took. And so it is with a heavy heart that I crown World of Warcraft, once the gold standard for MMOs, as the game that fell furthest from grace. Cut! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragonfighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Fob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.